Welcome to Temple Talks, a new podcast from Temple Israel in Minneapolis, where Jewish wisdom meets our ever-changing world. Join us as we talk with our favorite partners and thought leaders from around town and around the world. We hope these talks will inspire you, challenge you, and give us all new ideas about Judaism, religious life, and social justice. So for this week's episode of Temple Talks, we have Cantor Abelson and our former accompanist, Jason Rodofsky. Cantor, why don't you introduce Jason to our listeners? I'm thrilled to have Jason with me this afternoon to do this recording. Jason and I have known each other for quite a number of years. Um, I know knew him when he was part of the URJ and publishing music through for Transcontinental Music, which is now part of the URJ. Um, so I'm thrilled to have him here, and I think everybody knows who I am. And we thank Rabbi Moss for uh, providing all the tech uh, for this morning's program. So, and thank you all for being here this morning and listening to us. And uh, we hope you enjoy this podcast that we share. Wonderful. Welcome, Jason. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Great. And uh, Cantor, Jason, I know you're going to talk a little bit about your respective roles in Jewish sacred music, but is there a particular topic you're going to hope to address over the course of this podcast? I think we're going to look at some of the changing faces of Jewish music over the years that I've been here. And, and from Jason's perspective, uh, new music that's coming out of the publishing arm of, of the URJ these days. When I first came to Temple 35 years ago, the closing anthem was God is in his holy temple, accompanied by organ, choir of professional singers, very different than we have music today. At Passover, we sang Mendelssohn's Elijah. Every year when I was there, it was Mendelssohn's Elijah. We'd sing, if with all your hearts you truly see, seek me. Um, it was kind of odd. I came from a very traditional, conservative kind of background, um, but that's what the tradition was at Temple Israel. So we followed that. And uh, at the time it was Rabbi Stephen Pinsky was the senior rabbi and he loved having formal classical music performed on Shabbat and congregational participation was not something that was so much on the charts. Uh, no one really sang along. It was up to the cantor and uh, my voice to, to lead the congregation in prayer. And over the years, we've been blessed to have lots of talented musicians at Temple. Uh, Joe Black, uh, Rabbi Joe Black was here, Sim Glazer, uh, T Tobias now was another extremely talented mu musician we are blessed to have on staff. So um, we have quite a, a musical team um, and we've seen a lot of changes in the music o over the years since I've been here. My experience also kind of mirrors Cantor Abelson's. And when we hear some of the examples, and by the way, these are only little snippets. If you're interested, you can go on the Transcontinental Music Publishing website and hear longer examples. And I think you'll hear a shift from the earlier works and the first example that we're going to hear is actually composed in 1983. And then we'll come all the way almost to, to today. The first example is a setting of Sim Shalom by David Schiff. David is a trained composer. He went to Manhattan School of Music and the Juilliard School. And he now teaches in Portland, Oregon at a college. So his setting is from 1983, Sim Shalom. So there we have what would probably be considered a cantorial right. solo. Right, presentational. Right. Yes, very, very presentational. Much so. 
Yep. And we don't, it was probably be not as easy to sing along with something like no, this. No, and I, I don't know that uh, Debbie Friedman would, uh, would agree. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a much different style than the Debbie Friedman music that Very. we're used to at Temple. And as I said, it's from 1983. So, yeah, so now we're going to start shifting about every three, four, five years to hear different examples. Mm -hmm. Here's another a Seam Shalom, another Seam Shalom by Michael Isaacson. Michael is an interesting composer. He was trained at the Eastman School of Music where he holds mm -hmm. his PhD. He's now retired in Florida, but still composing. But to my knowledge, he was the only full-time Jewish composer or Jewish sacred music composer in that he didn't teach, he didn't perform. All he did was write music mm. and those commissions and sales sustained him. So this is from 1999. melody <laughs> and uh, I remember singing that a lot at Temple uh, when that song first was presented by Michael. I love Michael Isaacson's music. He also wrote a great setting of uh, the Micha Mocha. Um, yep. He wrote a number of pieces and we have moved away from them and I think they're really quite beautiful. His writing is lovely, very melodic um, and engaging for the congregation. I love that piece. Thank you for finding that. I just have a question about those two Sim Shalom settings that we heard. Would those always be basically piano and voice or would it be fitting for an organ or are we already kind of well past organ as the go-to instrument? Mm. Good question. That's a good question. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, even our neighbor in St. Paul, uh, Mount Zion, they still use the organ every weekend for the B'nai Mitzvah services and places. I was at Central Synagogue in Manhattan for a long time. And uh, they, well, you may know that that synagogue burned and the original pipe organ was destroyed. But when they rebuilt the synagogue, a family gave a brand new pipe organ and it's a marvelous instrument. So they still use that all the time. But I think many synagogues have moved away from using mm -hmm. the organ in deference to other instruments. And that's part of this shift, I think, that, that it has occurred over the last 20, 25 years. The next is by Steve Dropkin. We actually sing several of Steve Dropkin's pieces almost every week. It's a setting of Shalom Rav. Much, much more of a kind of modern pop aesthetic. Modern mm -hmm. pop style, very much right, so. And probably much easier to, once you hear it one or two times to start mm -hmm. to sing along. And the really wonderful thing, in my mind anyway, is that more, part, more, more people could participate directly instead of kind of being passive in the pew, passive. you know, they could actually sing along with many of the works. Not that we threw everything else out, because there are a lot of melodies that, you know, are more cantorial in style. But the next piece, a, a setting of Shalom Rav, is by Corey Weiss. Corey actually was trained as a French horn instrumental major at oh, University of Michigan, and then he became a rabbi. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was so, a rabbi. That's so funny. <laughs> He's at uh, Harcion in Toronto now, and this is his setting from 2009 of Shalom Rav. I, 
notice in that one and uh, that the rabbi also uh, doctored the text a little bit to make it more universal. Um, instead of Shalom Rav Al Yisrael Amcha, uh, a great peace should it, it should come upon your people Israel. In this version, it adds Ve'amim and on all the nations as well. So sometimes if you have a liturgical change you want to make, it won't fit with the old music. So you have to mm -hmm. make new music, or I'm sure you both have seen many times in which new liturgy is just, or a few new words are crammed into an old melody. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, when we, when we had the new prayer book come out, mm -hmm. then uh, many of the texts either had to be inserted or changed. Or reworked in some way. It, it, it rendered some pieces just really so difficult that we, we just couldn't do them anymore. Put them aside. Being true to the to the liturgy, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. The next is um, David Pressler, and David is another rabbi who was trained as a musician first at the Aaron Copland School of Music in Queens, hmm. and this is kind of a lively setting of his theme Shalom, also from two thousand nine. Sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uvracha chen vachesed verachamim. Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael, amecha. No. Fun. What, what do you think of that, Kim? I like it. That's very fun. It's uh, kind of celebratory. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. We might, we might have to include that. That sounds like, in term, yeah. musically, it sounds like that's after kind of the Shabbat band became a popular yeah, yeah, style. Yes, right. exactly. exactly. It seems that yeah. way, right? Yeah. Which a few years ago, you, you wouldn't have, well, depending on your tradition, it wouldn't have been instruments on sure. Shabbat. My God. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've moved past that a long time ago. <laughs> way past that. <laughs> Uh, Ellen Dreskin is uh, a cantor in the New York area. She's actually married to Billy Dreskin, who's a rabbi. And her setting of Sim Shalom is from around to 2012. I'm not sure because the anthologies were published, but they were uh, submissions from many people. And we don't know exactly unless they submitted when they writ wrote it. Um, it was just copyrighted in 2012. So here is Sim Shalom of Ellen Dreskin. Sim shalom, sim shalom, sim 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 shalom, sim shalom, sim shalom, tova uveracha, chayim chen vachesed veracha. That, re that reminds me that when we recorded that, I remember it was an evening, there had been a big snowstorm and Ellen either forgot her guitar or couldn't get it on the train or something. And anyway, we, we ended up using keyboard because normally Ellen would play the guitar herself and sing at the same time. So it just reminds me of that. Hmm. that were, you, were you involved session. in any of these other recording sessions? Oh, I was oh. involved with most of them. Yeah. So, mo so even though these are composers from different areas, they would was, would you compose? Would you do the recordings at Biennial right. or or just in New York? No, we'd bring them to New York unless the, the work was already recorded and on a commercial recording that we had permission to use. We would re-record re everything in New York, mm -hmm. and they weren't always recorded by mm -hmm. the composer. Um, it may be someone else, you know, a cantor in the area if they were from far away, mm -hmm. or the composer may not sing. So, you know, we yeah. have somebody else. But yeah, we really tried to make new recordings for all of the things we did. I didn't realize that. Yes. Jordan Franzel, uh, who was a cantor for a little while at Central Synagogue in Manhattan, he's now in Pennsylvania somewhere, wrote Asim Shalom. And again, I don't know, it was published in 2013. So mm -hmm. here is Jordan Franzel's Sim Shalom. Sim Shalom, 
Sorry that these tracks are cut off. We apparently have a copyright law, and you can only yeah, use we can't, like 20 <laughs> we can't steal the music. That's all right. right. That one, that, so, the arrangement there has a little bit of kind of uh, Beatles, Beatles vibes with the moving yeah, bass I was say, behind it, and I couldn't quite yeah. place it. But you're right. I think it's like Beatles yeah. sound it had that same feel to it. Right? That's Gordon. <laughs> That's so funny. The, the last um, track I think that we're going to listen to is uh, Setting of Yismahu. It's composed by Freda Mendelssohn, and I think it's sung by Haley Koblinski, who oh, was, was at a Temple year, a year ago. Yeah, you know, she was uh, my first high holidays here, so a year and a, a, year and a half ago. She Very right, talented. So this is Yismahu by Freda Mendelssohn. And just when you think you're going to sing along, we're cut off. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. So, like, nice piece. Freda comes from an interesting family. Uh, her husband, Jack Mendelssohn, is a cantor in the conservative movement, and their son, Danny, is now a cantor in uh, White Plains. Mm -hmm. And they have three little ones who are all on their way. <laughs> Not the way to become a cantor. Right? And I think Jack's brother was a cantor, wasn't he also? Yes. Um, yes, that's right. Blessed that's memory. Right. So yeah, in the way, singing family. Yep. Yes, very. Yeah, very much so. would, would you call that a, a klezmer or Hasidic niggin kind of? Well, I mean, yes, it's, it's very uh, typical of, of klezmer music, but it's also very engaging and I think would be mm -hmm. fun to mm -hmm. sing along. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Great. Yeah. So Very all nice. of these recordings came from the Transcontinental Music Shabbat Anthology recordings, which have sheet music, preview recordings, and you can also download or order a CD for the full recordings or yes. order the full sheet music. Uh, it's a great resource. Jason, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you got started with music, how you got started with Jewish music. When did you start working within the reform movement's musical output? Probably before you were born. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trained as actually um, a pianist starting at age four, and I just continued with that. I actually was at a Doth Yeshurun in what used to be the old synagogue now i think it's a unitarian church in south yeah. it is and it's and it's one block from my house here so <laughs> but it was wonderful old sanctuary mm -hmm. and in those days we had um what they call the professional choir but it was an auditioned choir of 24 voices and it was an all paid choir mm -hmm. and they would start rehearsing in august usually and sing for the holidays and then about once a month during the year and you had to say you were Jewish, whether you were or not, in order to be in the choir. Anyway, that <laughs> flash forward. I, um, oh, but where you can't leave out that that the cantor there, Mort Kula, Mort Kula yeah, yeah. was a dear friend of both of ours mm -hmm. and um, always did sort of major musical events at the congregation. Yes, we did. Always. And Minnesota he Orchestra. had a great legacy there. And many commissioned works, Tova Feldshu. Yes, commissioned. We, we had lots of wonderful programs. Yes. I don't know, you know, if that continues out in Minnetonka or not. But anyway, it was a wonderful time. Morty is unfortunately no longer with us, but they left, Charlotte and Mort left six sons. And there is a doctor, a lawyer, a rabbi, a cantor, a theater artist, and a conductor. Yes. <laughs> Right. So that was some very talented men. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and then I ended up moving to uh, New York in 1981 and got involved. I was at 
White Plains. No, first I was at Stamford, Connecticut, and then I went to White Plains for many years and eventually went into the Central Synagogue. And about the same time, um, Judy Tischler and her successor, who's now back at Transcontinental, mm -hmm. Joe Eglash, um, Joe and Carrie were moved somewhere. And so then I got the job as mm -hmm. the editor at Transcontinental for many years. So that's kind of how it happened. Did the reform movement always have a music publishing focus um, or was that a newer, I mean, newish? Transcontinental music goes back to 1936, I think. And, and, it, and it, you know, it was always a presence in New York. It was on Broadway. Years in, a, yeah. in an old building on Remember Broadway. That? Yeah. Oh, it, yes. It's moved Remember. several times. Yep. But anyway, uh, it still exists. We have a warehouse in the uh, Atlanta area, although the, that's another aspect which we could go on forever about publications, how those have changed, both recorded and the, the music is more now available as a download, printable PDFs and that kind of thing. So you just purchase the music over online and then you print it out on your end. Mm -hmm. And it really, um, in many ways, is a cleaner operation. You don't have to wait for it mm -hmm. in, um, you know, in the mail or it's, it's immediate. We had a funny story one time of some Hanukkah music that was on its way from the warehouse to the Wells Fargo Cor uh, Company Corral here in Minneapolis. And they were going to do a Hanukkah program in one of the buildings down at the IDS downtown. And the conductor was waiting for this package and finally it arrived on his step and he opened it up and it was a doorknob. And so he called me and he said, I thought you were sending this music. Well, it turned out the UPS truck had had an accident somewhere in Wisconsin. And so we both were laughing because we just could see all these sheets of music flying over the cornfields in Wisconsin. <laughs> and all these people wondering, what is this? <laughs> but anyway, so it's a much cleaner operation. And of course, the recorded tracks, mm -hmm. you can download now and everybody does that. So it's, yeah. it's a very different world than publishing even 25 sure. years ago. And, and, and Cantor, can you tell us a little bit what, what it's been like to incorporate new music at Temple? Do people... Have people reacted with excitement? Have people said, where's the um, classic Sim Shalom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's so true. Uh, people love the standards. People love the melodies that are familiar to them. Um, even though they may not sing, they want to at least feel like they can, partic can participate should they want to participate. Uh, I think when we do Shalom Aleichem at the end of a service, now on Friday nights, I think people love that because it's something they remember. Uh, hearing, um, I, I really do think people are gravitate to the melodies that they heard growing up as kids. Um, and many of the <laughs> many of the kids now who are coming for bar mitzvah, uh, I did their parents bar mitzvah. So it's it's really um, a, a unique blessing for me uh, to watch generations come through um, that I've help, helped to. Uh, educate and expose to Jewish music. It's really been, it's really been a joy for me. Um, very special. You know, when I started this, uh, I thought I wanted to be an opera singer. Uh, in fact, I did a national tour with Boris Grodowski and the Opera Theater when we toured the United States for uh, six months. I took a semester off from college to go do that. Um, but I realized that was not going to provide me the opportunity to be part of a community um, and um, decided you know, I had to go put in five years at HUC to be able to do what I really wanted to do. Uh, and I had a dear friend named Mark Lipson, who's still my closest friend in, in Connecticut, who um, said to me, come on, we'll go for a year. And if you don't like it, you'll go to Juilliard or you'll go to somewhere else and you'll just do something else. Uh, and thanks to Mark, he pushed me to, to come and go to HUC. And uh, we went there together and we survived with Jack Gottlieb and uh, what a wonderful crew of people um, who, were the, who were on the faculty at that point, music faculty, uh, who were extraordinary, 
uh, musicians who inspired me to keep going. And when, when you were at in cantorial school, was there an emphasis on composition for the cantors or, or was it more to learn the... Learn the classical cantorial. And then many of the people like Larry Avery w- would expose us at, at, and a number of other people, uh, he should rest in peace, uh, gave us extraordinary background on not just uh, reform composers, um, but uh, classical classical composers as well of, mm-hmm. of traditional music. Um, we had great teachers, really great, great teachers who inspired us all, I think, all of us. Yeah, and not so many of us are still working as cantors, but there's a handful of us who are still working, yeah, that were part of that group. Cantor, have, have you put out any of your own compositions? <sighs> Years ago, I wrote a couple things, uh, and they've been buried into the vault of my memories. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I did write a few things over the years. You know, um, I don't know. I'm not really a composer. I'm a, I'm a performer more than anything else. Great. And Jason, did you, um, how much have you interacted with the Cantorial School itself over the years? Did you ever teach or train there? Oh, yes. I did a lot of um, guest lectures, I guess you'd call it, in music copyright and literature and repertoire that we had at Transcon, I would do an annual visit actually twice a year because we used to drag music down there and sell it mm-hmm. <laughs> in the lower level. Uh, yeah. I don't know if they still do that. I don't know if Joe still does that or not. But anyway, yes, we, we always had a really close and wonderful relationship yeah. with, with um, HUC. You mentioned the transcontinental music, and the I believe the website is still transcontinentalmusicpublications.com, or Google it, and you'll find it in New York. And there are just thousands of pieces you can listen to and look right. at on their website. Well, thank you, Cantor Abelson, and thank you, Jason, for giving us such great examples of how sacred music is evolving constantly to our day and and how to access that. And I think our listeners will have enjoyed uh, hearing both of your backgrounds a little bit more. You're such familiar faces in our congregation, but but not everyone has uh, known your stories. Thank you, Tobias, Rabbi. As always, we'd love to hear your comments and questions about this week's episode. You can direct those to tmoss at templeisrael.com, and I will make sure that they get to their proper destination. Thanks again for listening.